Hi, this is Walter Koenig, and you're listening to TV Confidential. And Robert, just a reminder that we will play part two of our conversation with voice actor Michael Bell, beginning at the top of the hour. Michael Bell, the Artemis Gordon of film and TV animation. We hope you join us for that. In the meantime, in case you missed it, although if you are a Trekkie or a Trekker, I don't imagine you would have missed it, Dorothy Fontana passed away last week. Dorothy Fontana, the pioneering television writer-producer who was not only known for her many collaborations with Star Trek creator-producer Gene Roddenberry, but was also one of the first female writers to break the glass ceiling in television. Dorothy Fontana passed away last week at the age of 80. Among her many collaborations with Roddenberry, Fontana wrote six of the most classic episodes of Star Trek the original series, and was story editor and associate producer of Star Trek the Animated Series. Our friend Mark Cushman walked us through the backstory of Star Trek the Animated Series earlier this year when he appeared on TV Confidential. Among other things, Mark talked about the role that Dorothy Fontana played to help bring a primetime sensibility and a Star Trek sensibility to the animated series. Mark Cushman's books include These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and three, an epic-length history biography of Star Trek, the original series, that truly goes where no film or television reference book has gone before, and Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek in the 70s, the first of a two-volume exploration of Roddenberry's career in the decade between the cancellation of the original Star Trek in 1969 and the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979. As we pick up the conversation, Mark, we were talking about how all of the actors of the original Star Trek cared about the quality of the show. In the case of Leonard, he not only cared about the quality of Star Trek, the show, and Spock, the character, but he looked out for his fellow actors more than a lot of people realize, and that is particularly evident with the early development of Star Trek, the animated series. It is. You know, he only agreed to do it if the entire cast was involved. Originally, because of budget concerns, they were going to just bring in James Doohan, Shatner, Nimoy, and Michelle Nichols, and Majel Barrett, because Majel, obviously, being Gene's Mm -hmm. wife, was going to get in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, they figured that Jim Doohan and uh, and Michelle could do a lot of the other voices. Uh, James Doohan was very good at it, and he did a lot of different voices within the show, a lot of the aliens and the other characters. Uh, And Leonard said, I'm not doing it unless uh, George is there as well and um oh they weren't going to do Nichelle at first either they were just going to have they were going to have Majel do Nichelle's voice right Uhura. and he said unless you involve them i'm not doing it and walter koenig uh he couldn't get him in uh, walter was going to be part of the show you even see drawings in there of Chekhov, yeah. and he was in all the scripts those first several scripts that were written Chekhov is in there but for budget wise they just couldn't bring him in uh, and Leonard allowed that to happen because he said, well, Walter wasn't with us the entire run, but all the others were, and you can't do it without them. But they did give Walter script assignments, and he did one script, and I didn't know this, but then Walter told me in the interviews that Gene wanted him to come back and do another script, but he said no, because he had to do so many rewrites of the first one. <laughs> so all did. Gene always asked for more rewrites. Yeah. And it was a lot of work for the amount of money that was being paid. So after one experience of doing that, Walter said, I, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, well, look, it's hard enough writing a 30-minute script for primetime television. It's even trickier to write one for an animated series. And as you say, the no. the money was not was nowhere near as good as it would have been had you written for primetime. No. But a, another revelation is the caliber of writers – for mm-hmm. Star Trek the Animated Show were not your typical Saturday morning kitty cartoon stable of writers. And I understand the Writers Guild strike played an interesting role in making that happen. Yes. Yeah, there was a strike in uh, early um, 73 going and going through the summer. But, but you could write for animated shows because that was a different union. It was the primetime uh, writers that couldn't work. And so Dorothy Fontana, when she and Gene agreed to do the uh, animated series, and Gene was going to be the executive consultant, Dorothy was going to be the story editor and associate producer, she contacted all the original Star Trek writers, or the ones that they they liked, the ones that they got good scripts from that didn't need a ton of rewriting. And every one of them said yes, because they weren't doing anything. They couldn't work. 
So even though animated shows paid only a fraction of what a primetime show would pay, they were willing to do it. But Dorothy told me she thinks they would have said yes anyway because it was Star Trek. Yeah. They all loved it. The only one who said no was Gene Kuhn mm -hmm. uh, because he was working so much and creating shows of his own and so forth and writing uh, Quester tapes with Gene Roddenberry and everything. So he said, no, I'm, I'm going to pass. And it's a shame. Wouldn't it have been great to have gotten a Gene Kuhn script for the animated show? But they were writing as if it was the primetime show. They weren't aiming down at the kids. Uh, there were more giants and things like that and flying creatures in the animated show because Gene wanted to use advantage of the animation to do the things they couldn't have done before. But other than that, the mandate was make this feel like Star Trek. So you had all the original writers. You had all the original actors. Uh, you had Gene and Dorothy uh, uh, running the show. And so other than the limited quality of animation, which was the best TV had at the time, it, uh, it's really a very, very good show with good scripts. They were 30-page scripts, so they couldn't do as much as you could in a 60-page. You couldn't get as deep into the characters or deep into the story. But I've read all the scripts and read all the memos and put a lot of that stuff in the book, and you do see that the quality is there. And not only was the quality there, bear in mind that these are 30-minute scripts written for animated shows written at a time when most half-hour animated series were like three, seven, or eight-minute scripts. So you're getting a full-length story even for the animated form. And the other thing, I hadn't thought about this, but going back to how Roddenberry was ahead of its time, they really put a primetime sensibility to creating this quote-unquote Saturday morning show, unlike most other animated shows at the time. And it would have been interesting had NBC decided to put it on primetime versus Saturday morning. Yeah, and there weren't any primetime uh, animated shows at that time. There had been in the 60s. You had Flintstones and the Jetsons yeah. and Johnny Quest in primetime. And later on, we would have Simpsons and so forth. But that was a period in the 70s when they weren't doing it that way. And you know, one of the things I found so interesting, Ed, in doing this research, another, again, I was discovering things I never knew, just as you were when you were re reading the book, is that NBC wanted the series back within two years of canceling it. Yeah. And they were coming to Paramount every year saying, can we have Star Trek back in prime time with the original cast? You know, we shouldn't have taken it off the air in the first place. It's beating us. It's beating our new shows. The reruns are beating our new shows. We want it back. And Paramount wouldn't give it back to them because Paramount said, we're making so much money in syndication, we don't want to rock the boat. The bottom may fall out if we put it back into production, which is so ridiculous. And the real bad guy uh, here, the bad guy in, during the, the original run was, was NBC, mm -hmm. fighting Roddenberry on every single story. But the bad guy in this book, if you have to have a bad guy, it's Paramount Studios. They owned it, they controlled it, and they weren't giving it back to the network. And the other networks were willing to take it as well. Everybody wanted Star Trek. They, they were totally aware of how well it was doing in reruns and how strong it had become. And the, and the frenzy of the conventions and the everything. And they said, we've got to get this show back on the air. And Paramount kept saying no. That's why we got the animated series. It was the third time NBC had asked Paramount for the show back. And they said, well, we'll give it to you in another form as a half-hour animated show because that won't compete with the reruns. And so that's why the animated show became about on NBC because they had been trying to get the series back. On line with us is Mark Cushman, Mark's latest book, These Are the Voyages, Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek in the 1970s, Volume 1, 1970-1975. First of a two-volume set chronicling the period in Star Trek history spanning the cancellation of the original series and continuing through the making and the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979, a 10-year period in which Roddenberry experienced a lot of personal and professional ups and downs, both in film and in television, while Star Trek itself became a worldwide phenomenon. These are the voyages, Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek in the 1970s, Volume 1, 1970, 1975, available through Jacobs Brown MediaGroup.com, Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. Mark Cushman's website, MarkCushman.com. Before we leave the topic of Star Trek, the animated series, one other note. The animated series was done by Filmation. And again, I'm not a hardcore animated series scholar, but I have friends who are. 
And I understand Filmation is one of those companies that, you know, you get a knee-jerk reaction. You either like it or you don't. And they were very savvy about making animated shows that were cost-efficient. But the flip side of that is that they made them in the United States versus importing them overseas. And so it's very easy to overlook that. But the point I'm getting to is they also understood what they were doing, what they had with Star Trek, and they spent as much money as they possibly could to replicate the quality of the original show within the confines of an animated series. You know, if you look at their work, uh, even today, it's really very impressive. Now, the movement's not impressive. That, that's where it's stilted. And you see memos in their, the book there from Dorothy and Jean where they, they're telling the writers, we were going to give you a bigger canvas. You can do things you couldn't do on the original show. And the Filmation people were really great at coming up with aliens and alien landscapes and everything else. Very imaginative. Alien cities, uh, architecture. Uh, that was where they really did it right. But you see in those memos, Gene also tells the writers, the one thing we don't have is even though we have the voices of our actors, we don't have their facial expressions. We can't show that kind of stuff. And so that's what it was missing. That's where you, you had limited TV animation back in that era. And same thing with Jetsons and Flintstones. They, they basically had uh, one motion they could do, and, and they would move kind of in a stilted way. Uh, the good animation that we remember from television from that era wasn't done for TV. It was the Warner Brothers cartoons and the Disney cartoons, which had actually been done for the big screen in the 40s and 50s, and then were airing in the 60s and 70s on Saturday morning television. And they looked so much better, but they were being done by a studio uh, for the big screen the old-fashioned way. Mark Cushman's books include These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and three, an epic-length history biography of Star Trek, the original series that truly goes where no film or television reference book has ever gone before. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 are available through jacobsbrownmediagroup.com, amazon.com, and wherever books are sold online. These are the Voyages, Volume 1 is also available as an audiobook and features many sound clips featuring the voice of Dorothy Fontana herself. Mark tells us that Dorothy recorded her part for the audiobook last year and sounds just like she did when Star Trek was being made. Dorothy Fontana passed away last week at the age of 80. We'll play part two of our conversation with Michael Bell. When we come back, Michael Bell, the Artemis Gordon of film and TV voice actors. Then we will welcome Jared Hewitt, the voice actor of the Disney Channel. All that more coming up in hour number two of TV Confidential. Stay with us.